So I am here this afternoon with my friend and colleague, Professor Victor Meyer Schoenberger, who is the proud publisher of uh, this very exciting new book, Reinventing Capitalism in the Age of Big Data. Uh, and I'm lucky enough to have a few moments to ask you a few questions about the new book. Um, so Victor, given that uh, we've got uh, uh, some time to talk about this, do you want to give me a little summary uh, of, of, of the book? Sure, Vicky. Um, the, the, the nutshell of the book is mm -hmm. that as markets become data rich, that is full of data, and as we develop digital tools to, to use that data to improve human decision making mm -hmm. in markets, markets thrive. Markets become rewired as a mechanism of coordination. And, and it's not just that markets get rewired, but as a result, money loses some of its role, some of its function. Money always has been a, um, an informer in markets. But if data takes over that role, then, then money just be a store of value and a way of payment, uh, less an informer. Uh, that has huge repercussions for the institutions of money, like mm -hmm. banks. Um, but it also means that if the market gets much better, then the firm, as another organizational unit, loses some of its role as well. Um, and so we are in for quite some substantial changes. Um, but if we are not putting the right regulations in place, the mm -hmm. right framework uh, of uh, behavioral constraints, the danger is that those data-rich markets become concentrated, mm -hmm. run by very few companies, and that not only exposes us to their informational power, mm -hmm. but also to a single point of failure. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about uh, a really significant, almost seismic shift in the nature of capitalism in this data-driven age. I think if we can just try and make this live for people by perhaps thinking through a couple of examples, um, one of the industries you talked about is one that's very familiar to most of us is something like, say, travel and holidays. So what, what, would it, what, would it, what does it mean? How is that, how is that industry being transformed uh, by the availability of, of data and how is that changing the nature of choice? Well, you know, when we talk about in the book, when you talk about data-rich markets, mm -hmm. uh, then what we mean is not that that will buy or sell data. What we mean is that buyers and sellers on markets will have an easier way to find their match yeah. um, through data. Uh, and, and just think about how our parents, if I think back about how my parents uh, chose a, a particular holiday. Uh, 40 years ago, we would go through a, um, a, a thick book uh, of um, beautiful uh, pictures and wonderful descriptions yeah. about hotels in Greece and Italy. Mm -hmm. And we knew everything was fake to an extent. Mm -hmm. And so we were trying to read through the lines and then make a decision. And if the hotel that we chose and we went there uh, wasn't absolutely terrible, we would go there the next year because the risk was too high to try something new yeah. than the year thereafter. And compare that to how our students do that today. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when, when they book a, a trip, they go on some of those booking platforms uh, and they look at the various hotels there, but they also look at the reviews. Uh, they look at the photographs, mm -hmm. not of the hotel, but of the people mm -hmm. that stayed in the hotel that they took there. Uh, they go to Google Street View and look around uh, what, what's the, the neighborhood of the hotel. So there's eminently more data available mm -hmm. for them to make a choice. And when they go there, uh, the chance that they will be completely surprised is much smaller. Mm -hmm. um, however, that takes some effort. And not everybody wants to spend hours in front of booking platforms uh, trying to find the right match. Um, fortunately, uh, that's been taken care of by digital assistants now. Um, some of them are pretty good, some of them not so. Mm -hmm. uh, but they help us make sense of the, the things on offer. That's what data-rich markets really are. That's a really nice uh, way, I think, of thinking about this. Now, that last point, though, about the role of digital assistance, mm. I think is really crucial. So we're not talking about just a, a situation where we as individuals make our choices on the basis of ever richer data, but if you like, where those very choices can be facilitated by third parties on our behalf. Um, now, in, in the book, you, know, you, you, you paint quite an optimistic picture, I think, of, 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 of how this will improve people's lives. But there are also, of course, others who really fear you know, an ever greater role for AI or machine learning and, and perceive this as something to worry about. So, you know, are you really clear that this brings no risks? No, we're not clear. In fact, we have an entire chapter mm -hmm. devoted to the risks, and we 
we begin this chapter with a very stark story uh, of an aircraft crashing uh, into the South Atlantic mm -hmm. uh, because the humans and the computers did not understand mm -hmm. each other. Uh, and then, therefore, their joint decision-making mm -hmm. was awfully flawed. flawed. Um, and so, in that sense, uh, I am worried uh, about the risks uh, involved in this transition. Um, when, we, when we think about markets more generally, uh, markets are um, wonderful social innovations uh, to coordinate people because of their decentralized nature. Decentral decision-making in the markets means that they're resilient. If somebody screws up with their decision-making, the whole market doesn't go bust. Uh, and and, and that, that's really an advantage of the market. But for the markets to work other than to have a lot of things on offer, you need to have all the information that you need. And you need to translate that information into decisions. And that's hard for us humans to do. Uh, studies have shown that we humans have difficulties even comparing three different products along three different dimensions. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what we have done as humans is to break this complexity down into something that's incredibly simple, and that's price. Mm -hmm. And so we only compare really about price. And of course, you know, that is one of the most dramatic outcomes, I think, of, of the book, is this, this sort of relentless focus on the extent to which our traditional understanding of firms businesses, our over-reliance on price as a signal, how all that is going to change. And, and and I would imagine, and again, I think you're probably quite clear about this, but there are going to be winners and losers, aren't there? Absolutely. So, so what types of firm do you think will flourish in this environment and which ones will we see struggle? Well, when we when we look at what the firm is, the mm. firm is an alternative to, to coordinate uh, human activities, yeah. an alternative to the market. Uh, the firm isn't decentralized in its decision making, it's highly centralized. Mm. Um, that means that less information needs to flow through the firm. So the firm has an advantage. It doesn't require that everybody needs to know everything. But the disadvantage is that the firm is depending on really good decisions made at the top. If you have on the top, if you have decisions that are really terrible, then the firm goes under. And, and the entire organization goes bankrupt, unlike the market that doesn't go bankrupt if there is a single decision in the market that is, that is flawed. So in that sense, the firm has always been an alternative to the market. And it has been a good alternative as long as the market was constrained by just focusing on price. But if we rewire the market so that it can really provide better matching across many dimensions, the firm gets under pressure. And, and so companies that rely on hierarchies, mm -hmm. uh, structures, uh, that are that are typical uh, for conventional firms, they will suffer much more. The smart companies, the Spotify's, the Daimler's of the world, they bring the market into mm -hmm. the firm. Decentralization, um, competition, all these kind of dynamics that are not hierarchical. And I think, you know, you, particularly in areas like fintech, you know, you're quite explicit, I think, in some of your sort of criticisms, aren't you, about the sort of how some of the older players don't seem to be adapting very quickly to, to these new challenges. And they're open for the taking by, by some of these new entrants. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. the, the, the problem for many banks, for example, mm. is that they have been doing extremely well and have been very successful doing what they have been doing. Mm. But therefore, they have unlearned thinking about anything else. Mm. Uh, and now that they're, they're facing a almost existential challenge, they have difficulties recollecting what made them big in the first place. Um, in, in the book, we, we talk about the early beginnings of investment banking in the United States, when it was a business of connecting people together, a business of information exchange, of information intermediaries. Those were the roles of the investment bankers rather than being a commercial investment bank and being focused on price. It was a role of an information intermediary. Mm. And so if the banks rekindle that original idea, mm. they are still going to be irrelevant. But then there are information brokers of one sort or information intermediaries of one sort or of another. Mm. And few banks will actually be able to do that. Mm. Well, I think I'm going to adjust my share profile on the basis of reading your book, definitely. Um, <laughs> Thinking about the, the big social changes as well as economic changes then that this will bring, again, uh, you know, you've clearly given quite a lot of thought to, to what future forms of regulation might look like in this context and what types of social challenge they have to address. So one of them 
you you know you, you think quite hard about the the nature obviously of changing employment and labour. Uh, and what measures might be required to deal with that. Uh, as we've just discussed a little bit, we've talked about the changing maybe size and shape of firms. And again, you know, you think a little bit about uh, what might be required for that. So maybe let's just take perhaps the first of those and see what, what regulation might look like in these changed labour markets. Now, you bring up this concept of universal basic income mm -hmm. uh, as, as a sort of a fairly radical um, suggestion. Tell me, tell me about how you think that might be required. Sure. Um, when we look at the labour market, what we find is uh, that that there isn't a good matching going on between employees and employers. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a lack of information and there is a lack of rational decision making going on. Um, the the employees usually need to provide a lot of information, mm -hmm. but the employer doesn't so much, mm -hmm. and so that leads to suboptimal transactions. That basically leads to unhappiness in the job, uh, and we can improve that. We can improve that matching. Um, but perhaps what we need to do as well is to open that bundle that we call full-time employment. Mm -hmm. um, why should it be that you know it's a good idea for 35 or 38 or 40 hours a week to work at one employer only mm -hmm. uh, with one particular set of tasks? Maybe we should sort of divide up our time. In the past, we couldn't because employment markets weren't flexible enough and we couldn't find enough matches. But maybe in the future, we can. Mm. Um, and so in the future, um, particularly the younger generation may combine different kinds of work, 20 hours here, 15 hours there, and maybe even work only 30 hours in order to use the rest of the time to give back to the community. Uh, and enable, to enable that, to enable that additional flexibility, we suggest a what we call a partial universal yeah. basic income. That is uh, a couple of hundred, let's say 500 pounds a month that enable people not to uh, come by with, with that amount, but to have that extra flexibility uh, when they hit the labor market. But that requires labor markets to just be fundamentally different than what they are today. Employers to become much more transparent and also unions to think about their role in that play. It is a really radical shift, isn't it? I, I did like the fact, though, that you are, you know, you're quite realistic, I think, about the limitations on this. I mean, just the sheer, the sheer cost of having a full universal basic income scheme, for example, yes. you, you set that aside. Yes. But, but no, that's what I found so interesting was that this was, this was much more plausible. Um, and then the sort of second regulatory uh, innovation, which is an, a more unusual one, one that I've heard much less discussion of, is this concept of a, of a data tax, but not a sort of per byte fee, if you like, but rather the idea that obviously as a firm gets bigger and collates more, ever more data, it also gains a sort of a market advantage. And therefore, that one way to stimulate competition yes. would be to open up some of that data yes. to competitors. Yes. Now, I, I don't think I'd seen that elsewhere. And that sounds like a really interesting uh, idea. How would that work in practice? Well, let me first take a moment um, uh, in, in order to sort of uh, explain a little bit why this is such an important mm -hmm. issue. To me, it is the crucial, the most important mm -hmm. issue when we talk about the next generation of mm -hmm. digital transformation. Um, in the past, it has always been the case that if you become bigger and bigger as a company, you can produce more cheaply. It's called scale economies. Uh, it's quite obvious. Uh, and uh, yet, companies have not only become big, but sometimes they also have fallen apart. So why is this if we only have scale economies? Because we have something else as well, and that's called innovation. And through great new ideas, even from a dingy little startup, the dingy little startup can produce something that the large organization can't, and therefore dethrone the large organization. So innovation, in a way, is the counterforce to scale economies. And so they kept each other in balance, and they ensured that there wasn't uh, a dangerous market concentration. But that was because innovation was based on humans, human ingenuity, human uh, creativity. Now we are seeing that innovation is driven by data used in machine learning systems, the self-driving cars learning from, from more data. And that means that innovation itself then is um, rooted, is, 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 is shifts towards those companies that have the most access to data. And so that means those that are already big are already getting bigger again because scale economies are now aligned with innovation economies. 
uh, and uh, hinder small uh, startups uh, from dethroning the incumbent. And we need to fight that. And the suggestion that we make in the book is a progressive data sharing mandate, uh, forcing the large companies to let smaller companies access some of the data that they have. It is such an, such an interesting idea. And I, I really hope for me that that's, that's something that really is drawn out of this book and, and sort of held up as a wider discussion. One, one last question, and maybe reflecting on your scholarship to date. I mean, I can't help but go back to your earlier book about delete, the virtue of forgetting, and just to ask maybe this last question about whether or not there can be still a virtue of forgetting in a, in a, in a, in a society like this. What happens to the individual who values their personal privacy, for example, more than they value you know, the expanded choice that this offers? Right. You know, in the last chapter of the book, we really, we really look at that. We really look at what is the essence of being human. Yeah. Um, in addition to being creative and original, we think the essence of being human is that we still can choose who is making the decisions. Whether we delegate uh, decision-making to a recommendation engine or to an artificial intelligence system, that's fine. Or whether we keep it to ourselves, as long as we choose who is making the decisions, we are still in charge. And I think we need to protect that kind of a liberty. To me, this is the equivalent of privacy and data protection in the 21st century. It protects human volition. Um, if in the past we were worried about the surveillance state and Orwell's 1984, in the future we need to be worried about something that we that I described in the lead, something that we wrote about in Big Data and something that we are now writing again in Reinventing Capitalism. Uh, and that is what we need to be worried about is uh, the, the, the abolition, in effect, of free will. And we must fight that. We, as humans, still need to call the shots. I think that's a perfect place to end. Victor Meyer Schoenberger, author of uh, this great new book, Reinventing Capitalism. Thank you so much for your Thank time. You, Thank, Thank you, Vicky. Thank you.